David's there. Right. It may not have escaped your notice that this whole thing rests on innovative ways of interrogating data. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it, it, it's really a, a, a great opportunity uh, to be able to talk in a, in a forum where we have all the, all the elements to, to really change the way we think about uh, using information, especially genetic information in medicine. Uh, this place uh, was absolutely crawling with geeks yesterday, and, uh, and I'm just representing all of them. We have this one big vision, and it's, and it's very simply stated, um, no one institute has enough data on its own to make progress at this point. They're holding in silos the vital information we need to really decode our own health. We can change that. We are actually very actively working on an internet of information about our genetic health uh, that will be immediately accessible. So I, I loved when John just held up the iPhone. I mean, that essentially a, a world of technology awaits us if we can break through some of the social issues and the technical issues. The internet was not an easy thing to build, uh, but once built, was completely revolutionary. And we can ride on top of that and build something quite extraordinary. So uh, I'm representing the data working group with uh, my colleague Richard Durbin, who was unfortunately had a conflict and was not able to join us at this meeting. We have now a very powerful set of task teams all working under the same umbrella. The physical manifestation of our work on the internet is at GitHub. So we are taking advantage of a massive cultural change towards large scale open source software development. We're taking advantage of a platform that was built for other industries and other sectors of the economy to get together and build large scale open source projects so we didn't have to build this thing ourselves. Uh, and we're taking advantage of an ethos uh, of how we do things differently. Uh, unfortunately, the biomedical world of data exchange or lack of data exchange is too much caught over, caught up in decades old paradigms that don't work uh, these days. And we can take a lesson from the other more nimble industries and do an open approach to software design. All groups are welcome to participate. Just go to the GitHub site. If you're able to technically contribute, you're welcome immediately. Decision making is done by protocols that were designed by the Apache Open Source Foundation. So it's a, it's a way of making decisions that's uh, geek to geek and is developed over a cultural, uh, developed as a culture over time. We talked about tweaking it a bit yesterday uh, to speed certain things up, uh, but those to me are the details. It, 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 it is the right way to do it. And in this, we get credit in terms of what you've committed to the overall large software project. This credit is actually portable. If you go to apply for an industry job, you can talk to them about the amazing open source contributions you've made. For example, it's different from journal credit. Many of you are academics and you're thinking, oh, it's got to be publication in a journal. And leadership itself within the work product life cycle is determined by contr contribution at that point. Uh, it's not a political appointment. It's what you bring to the table. Uh, we have 90 companies that are involved in this alongside the not-profit groups. And we collaborate very well with for-profit entities. Uh, we have a mutual understanding. Everybody wants the interface to work. Everybody wants a common language. And we are going to create an open source reference implementation that will be free from anybody, for anybody to use. We're in the process of that. Uh, right now, and we have released a first copy of that. However, 
Industry can build bigger, faster, better. And it will plug into the ecosystem because we share the same interface. And that's what makes it all work. So the way uh, modular systems are built is illustrated in this slide. We, we have uh, various repositories. And I like to think about these things as essentially trusted stewards of your data. I notice Heidi used the word steward. I like that. Um, because it, it gets away from some of these ownership issues. Oh, do I own my genome? Does the hospital own my genome? Who's taking care of it for me? And so forth. So let's erase all the preconceptions and think, well, there will be some trusted stewards that, we, that will hold our data for us. And those trusted stewards understand how to exchange that data, make it available to research according to our wishes according to an infrastructure uh, that was built from the Global Alliance. And then all of industry can build apps on top of that so that you can get data from various trusted stewards and do something with it, Makes, make meaningful contributions uh, to society, to health, through, those, uh, through that common interface. Any bit can plug into any other bit. Now, I'm going to be talking about beacons. I'm channeling Mark Fume sitting back there. He's a brilliant leader for this project. He's done a great job in thinking about how we can pull together the simplest of all genetic queries and make it a ubiquitous feature that's available on the internet. And uh, it was Jim Ostell who first, uh, who first identified this uh, in, 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 a, in, a, in a think tank. Um, at, at the last meeting um, in London, just ask, well, do you have any genomes? Say, here's my trusted steward. Do you have any genomes in your database that have a particular variant at a particular position? Answer, yes or no. This is something that poses no serious technical barrier, but it certainly poses a uh, social barrier uh, to work out the details of how we would exchange even the simple atom of information, the, the, the most atomic unit of genetic information. Mark went ahead and built this brilliant uh, prototype uh, with the first beacons all coming together in a beacon of beacons. Uh, and, and that was essentially the first manifestation of this. This is, Mark gave me this picture. There's Jim in the middle. So this was London, March 2014, and this idea just happened. Uh, and that's why it's so exciting to be at these meetings, because things like that uh, just happen. So the advantages of this uh, are that it's an open API, so everyone can be interoperable. It's a federated model, so you don't have to give your data to some centralized database. You can give it to your trusted steward, or you can be your own trusted steward. And it's technically simple, and the type of query is sufficiently primitive that it mitigates, but does not completely eliminate, risk of identification. We've had amazing uh, adoption of this under Mark's leadership. He has uh, inspired a good number of companies, institutions, uh, and other organizations to actually build beacons. Uh, this is kind of a timeline of what happened in the last year. Um, and uh, these are the numbers that Mark just collected. 15 organizations have lit uh, beacons, 155 uh, individual beacons within them, and 252 data sets. So that's a very, very uh, dramatic uptake of, of a new technology that's still really uh, in its early uh, defin defining stages. It's still self-defining. It's still getting its legs, so to speak. Now, Bartha mentioned that the beacon has an extra layer uh, when you want to dig deeper. So the beacon query I've been talking about is this one at the end. And this is intended for an anonymous user on the internet, completely open, just is there any any record of this particular variant anywhere in your database. If you want to know more, you need to 
make some agreements. And uh, the beacon has suggested this intermediate layer, uh, as Bartha said, called registered. And that means you are no longer anonymous, essentially. You have to say who you are and say something of your credentials. If you really want somebody's whole genome, obviously identifiable, very personal, very private information, it's clear that you're going to have to go all the way to the fully controlled uh, with some kind of contract now. There has to be a, a legal agreement behind that. But I think it's important to have this registered intermediate level. I think we can do a lot there, uh, and I would like to develop it. So is the beacon of beacons the answer? Actually, uh, we've talked about this, and the internet itself is the answer, right? So we shouldn't have to build any aggregating devices. You should, this should be, uh, that, that exists at any host, particular host institution, this should be ubiquitous. And the whole way that the Global Alliance Data Working Group is operating is we want to make it as ubiquitous as finding a restaurant on your phone. So what do we do on the internet? We have a name. We need to agree on names for objects that we want. We need to agree on protocols on how to get them, and we need to agree on what the answer means, how to semantically interpret the content. And this is the very basis for the web. A name is a URL. A protocol is HTTP, that's how we actually get stuff. And the content is HTML, which has a definition for how then we can interpret it. We know whether it's an image or text when we get it on the other side. We just need to specialize this for the kind of information that we are transmitting. So we have a notion of how to name things, and uh, uh, John uh, gave a nice example of this. This is using a cryptographic hash scheme, so the name doesn't reveal anything about the object. We have methods for requesting data that are incorporated in our, all our tools and are going to be used across the board with GA4GH apps. And we have a schema for each type of data that says what it is in a very precise mathematical way that can be machine interpreted and we can reliably build apps that depend on that interpretation. I want to illustrate another project here among the uh, many projects that are with the data working group at this point and this is something uh, that Gil McVean and uh, Benedict Payton are leading. And it is a project to build a reference variation that will, a reference of human variation that will be much more comprehensive and unbiased than our current situation. We all know that we are uh, in a place where we have chosen or anointed one particular human genome as a representative for all humanity. And with that choice, we have given up a lot of our very genetic soul. Uh, there is a huge amount of diversity. And by leaving it out of the standard reference, we have actually crippled ourselves in many ways. Ewan mentioned it. We've been talking about it for a decade. There is a better way to think about representing human genetic variation than one particular representative human genome, and that is using a graph. We hope by this graph representation of all of the variation in our human population to get around what is essentially a giant Tower of Babel problem. We have an enormous number of absolutely outstanding efforts to codify all of the genetic variation uh, that exists within our human populations and link it to phenotype whenever possible. The problem is that all of these different schemes have a lot of different ways for saying the same thing and none is definitively comprehensive. This is very much holding us back from medical applications of human genetic information. 
we need to be able to call a spade a spade right now. This is it. This is the variant that has to be absolutely unambiguous for clinical applications. So what we're trying to do within this project, which is, exists within our reference variation task team, is to, to build one big graph reference that will be comprehensive and be a Rosetta Stone for all of the different ways that we think about referring to human variation. Now, that doesn't mean we're going to replace those. We will be able to translate from this into any of the existing nomenclatures. But we want one comprehensive uh, archival representation of this. And it will be a graph. And I'll illustrate what these graphs are, because these seem very scary to people when you first think about them. And hopefully, the set of slides that Benedict uh, has prepared for me. This is an example that Gill created from his uh, analysis of the major histocompatibility complex on chromosome 6. We all know that we have an enormous amount of genetic variation within the region that encodes for our genes that control our immune response. That's vital to us. We don't want the one pandemic that's going to wipe us all out. Our uh, ver variety of genetic responses to pathogens is absolutely fundamental to our species as it is to other species. So we see an enormous amount of genetic variation. And any particular person uh, may be represented by one path through this graph. Uh, in particular, the red path might denote the human reference genome, the arbitrary uh, representation of this MHC region on chromosome 6. Uh, these uh, few megabases of DNA may be represented by one path. Now, as you know, nine other versions of that have been added to the reference genome. Unfortunately, nobody pays attention to them except of a few experts that, that use them in various ways. And that is a drop in the bucket compared to the actual human genetic variation that exists at this marvelous locus. If you zoom into this graph, so what is it? What do every one of these lines mean? There's structure here. It's not complete random spaghetti, but because we share a heritage, there is haplotype structure, there's a history here of all of the human ethnic populations. And so there will be dominant kinds of DNA with minor variations on top of that. Think of it as a theme in music uh, with some beautiful variations. There may be different themes through this region and then uh, technical variations on top of those. Zooming in a little bit further, we see at its core, we're down to the individual bases of DNA here. And so this, again, if we imagine this red path is a reference genome, the reference genome may be G, C, C, A, G in this particular part of chromosome 6 within the MHC region. And there may be, within our human population, some very, very common local variants. Instead of C, A, there may be people that have C, G. And so this is just represented as an alternate path within this graph. So another person's chromosome may not match the reference chromosome, but it may go C, G, T, G, and so forth here. Similarly, there are other small variants around here. And then there are other paths that don't look at all like this, but have their own minor variations that are not shown at this high zoomed-in level. The point is that right now we have a reference genome and we say, oh, I'm at position 1,325,649 on chromosome 6. And then, unfortunately, a couple of years later, Somebody figures out, oh, well, there was a base way upstream <laughs> that we forgot, and all of the coordinates downstream <laughs> change, uh, much to everybody's chagrin. In this model, every base within this giant graph of human variation has a permanent identifier. Think about it. It could be a randomly generated identifier like this, or it could be a systematic identifier, but it's something that won't change when we learn more about human variation. In particular, if we had another G right here, well, we could add that to the graph, and it won't change the identifier of this position. 
And this is very important, again, for clinical applications because how we identify our human genetic variants should be durable over a period of decades, and it will be in this new structure. So I hope I've given you a flavor of at least two of the projects that we do. I, it was very hard to choose in limited time among all the spectacular projects that are going on in the Data Working Group. In particular, not only are we contributing to the beacon uh, but we're contributing to the wonderful uh, projects that you just heard about in the previous talks, and we are honored to be able to actually work with that. Uh, and in particular, uh, the data working group has uh, uh, contributed Gunaresh to the uh, whoops, sorry, um, to the to to the BRCA, who's leading our, our data working group to pull together things. So the ultimate goal here is that it should be as easy as finding a Chinese restaurant in a town that you've never been in before to get all of the information you need for your health. We have to have that as a system that's not just for the consumer, but it is for the doctor and for the researcher, all three aspects of the same thing. If we can pull this together, in a clean internet-based system of exchange of information in a secure way, protecting privacy as needed, then the whole world, the whole internet, will be a health learning system. Every case at the consent of the individual will become part of the data that we learn from. We can match to it, as Heidi was saying. We can document better whether a particular variant of BRCA is actually pathogenic or not, and no data will be left on the table. It breaks my heart to think about when I work on cancer, especially childhood cancer, all of the data that's left on the table right now, all of those valuable molecular measurements that we could be using that are not available to us. We absolutely have to change that. I want to especially thank the new working groups, and I won't have time to go through all of the working groups in this, but in addition to what I just talked about, we heard a spectacular uh, presentation from Barbara Wold and her group. Uh, Roderick is here today. Mitch uh, was not able to make it, uh, but there are a number of uh, people here, uh, including Sean from the RNA and Gene Expression Task Team. Obviously, it's not just DNA, folks. Uh, and, and we are very serious and we respect RNA. We give it the respect it should deserve now. Um, the very annotation team is extremely important because it's great to have all this DNA mapped out and all of this big graph, but it's hard to now, it gets harder and harder to say, well, where are the genes in this damn graph? <laughs> where are the exons start and stop? That's going to be a non-trivial task and they are up to it. Uh, genotype to Phenotype is a really exciting new team uh, that Adam Margolin and Nicole Washington uh, have forged ahead. They already have API implementation for a lot of their ideas. And this is to actually codify the relationships between genotype and phenotype. They're actually sitting down seriously and asking, what kind of relationships are we going to be talking about between genotype and phenotype? Can we codify the different types? How are they quantitatively measured? What evidence supports them? And all of that in a machine-readable format. That's going to be very, very fundamental to linking all of the work that we do in the weeds, so to speak, down at the DNA level and the RNA level to the actual decision-making that happens on a daily basis in patient care. And finally, the ultimate geeky stuff is getting this all to work. That's the plumbing, the last thing, and I won't uh, go into it uh, in detail. So uh, there are many, many other people to thank, but I think I'm out of time. The original uh, teams, uh, you and Bernie mentioned uh, the file formats team that he leads. Uh, there are a number of other important teams that they, we, ha we heard updates from, uh, fantastic chairs and so forth. Uh, it, it is a uh, work of love by hundreds and hundreds of people, 500 people involved, uh, over a thousand commits on GitHub uh, just in the last year. Very exciting. Thank you.
David, thank you. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to just take a minute to say personally, I want to pay tribute to David, not only because the technology you're talking about absolutely underpins uh, and is going to transform the way in which all these systems work, and not only for the fact that you somehow seem, without any effort, to be able to manage, uh, manage and administer and create hundreds of people working in a semi-organized fashion that actually produces the goods. But most of all, the, the passion that you bring to this and the clarity of your view of the long-term social consequences of the stuff we're trying to do are, are just absolutely critical to this organization. So my thanks to you and your open note. I want to clap. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Thank you so much, Martin. I, I do nothing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, no, everybody just joins in and, right and contributes. I do nothing but let people you know, shine. <laughs> That's okay, that's a real talent. So, are there questions? Please. Uh, David, thank you, that was wonderful. Um, so, you, as you correctly pointed out at the very end, uh, the reference genome will not be useful until the annotations are there, uh, tools as well. Yes. Um, one of the things that I think gives a lot of us, uh, you know, trouble on a day-to-day -day basis with the current reference genome and the annotations on it is also quality, right? Is understanding, you know, and, and even some of the wonderful annotations you've collected in the UCSC genome browser. We all right. know that some are a little yeah. more useful than others. Are there things we can learn from the internet community, from, you know, crowdsource rankings, or, or any other thing we can do in this data model to try and help the community build a better consensus around quality of some of these attributes? I, I think we, I think there's a great untapped potential in these uh, crowdsource uh, quality metrics. Um, we uh, actually, with the genome browser, our philosophy was uh, we tried to do as much uh, choice as we can to, to put the high quality data forward, but when there are multiple uh, like gene predictions, then we just give you both of them. And one of the quickest ways to see what, how sure you are about a gene is to pull up three tracks and see that three reliable databases don't agree on that gene, then you know it's, it's not, that piece of information is not rock solid. Uh, so that's one simple way, is just having multiple things to compare. That is a pain in the ass, of course, to always have to do the comparison yourself. And so it would be nice if the community uh, could feedback and, and uh, have a very, very simple, uh, you know, like to don't like uh, kind of uh, scheme. And we actually wanted to do that with the UCSC Genome Browser as well, but there is a pushback on uh, tracking. Uh, so people were sensitive. We don't track what, the, what you ask, what questions you, what genes you're looking at on the Human Genome Browser. And people are sensitive about that. So that made it a little more difficult to implement a crowdsource feedback thing. But, but maybe, you know, voluntarily uh, we, could, we could have people do that. Um, so that's my experience with that in the past. I think we should definitely do that. Yeah, this is a great talk, and I really also enjoyed Heidi's um, previous talk on matchmaking. So I did notice that there is seems both matchmake and beacon all try to identify something similar, which is finding a match or presence of a variant in someone else's local database. Can you elaborate a little, bit, a little bit about the difference about these two approaches? Right. And I also have a second question just for both of you to, to think. So one of the real application in rare uh, kind of genetic predis predisposition syndromes that we are looking at is when you find a rare variant in our data set. We don't have a control population to look at. Uh, because the, the best source you, uh, you have is uh, like NHLBI's um, database, exome sequencing database, but they are not uh, non-healthy individual as well. So the only right. resource we have, so, but there's also people like going to uh, 21Me uh, using kind of their approach to, you know, individual, healthy individual mm -hmm. to get them yes. themselves genotypes. So this is more or less a good control group Yes. That when you're looking at the genotype, you know, we don't even know the individual genotype. We just want to know the frequency 
in that cohort outside. Yes. So can you elaborate okay. how this can I, I have it. Yeah. So, um, there, so two things just really quickly. I, I do, we absolutely do need better uh, healthy co cohorts and uh, the, everyone needs um, a control arm for whatever they're doing. Uh, and if, you, if you're studying heart disease, maybe you want to uh, have your own control arm or maybe you want to combine control arms for, from other studies to get big numbers. We all need big numbers, but you do run into trouble if you're studying heart disease and you use a control arm from a neurological study, then maybe those people had heart disease. Uh, you know, there were controls for the neurological, but uh, so one, one amusing idea I heard was uh, we should take, uh, there, there's a whole collection of of patients of, of people who uh, are, are elderly and run marathons. <laughs> so that's, right. Okay, that's a great healthy co cohort, right? Uh, but uh, returning to your other question, what's uh, the difference between uh, a beacon and a matchmaker? So match, they are conceptually quite, quite distinct. So matchmaker, you're matching the individual. So I'm saying, do you have another individual like my individual that can be a multi-dimensional query uh, they may have certain genetic configuration, a combination of genetic and phenotypic attributes that you want to match. And it is a fundamentally a matching service. Uh, Beacon, on the other hand, is a query about a database. So you can't ask a Beacon, um, do you have a genome with an A here and with this phenotype and with a T here and with a G here? Uh, that's too identifying at this point. So you're, it's, it's a relational query about one attribute at a time. And if you want to go deeper into a matchmaking mode, then you have to go through the register or the control levels. So you could go from a beacon uh, because it's totally open, whereas matchmaker is of necessity a closed system among physicians. You could think about Beacon as a as like a, just a very like a Google search. You know, all right, I'm just going to Google it first, and then after I'm interacting with that web page, I may drill down. Thank you very much indeed. Um, oh, Heidi. Okay, last one because I, we're we're short on time. Yeah, just to briefly yeah. add to that point, you know, in in the matchmaker exchange, in most cases, the variants are actually different when you're matching patients, and so Beacon and Matchmaker are very complementary systems. Sometimes you want to know if the variant is out there, and you can use Beacon, and many of the matchmakers are launching the Beacon functionality also. But for matchmaking, you often need different variants in the same gene, so there's a slight distinction right. there. Right. Very good point, Heidi. Thanks. Just a short comment. Um, no data left on the table. I, I absolutely love that notion. Um, and I just want to point out that that's actually the biggest data that we're leaving and the most expensive data that we're leaving on the table is the clinical data. It's trillions yes. of dollars <laughs> worth spent in healthcare and there is um, something to a decimal of that percentage wise that's being used in the clinical trials. So the challenge would be how do we discuss to scale, tap, and really be um, um, somehow create these data stewardship models where that biggest chunk and the most expensive part of the data would be utilized. Yep. Go yes. On. What's the answer? Absolutely. I've been waiting I, for the uh, answer. I don't have a complete answer to that, but there are, uh, I, I know there are a number of of companies that are anxious to help with that, and we're trying to open up from the kind of locked-in system that we are right now, kind of uh, locked into various vendors in various geographic locations, uh, into more, uh, you know, open it up for a, for a highly competitive uh, internet-based uh, data entry, storage, and exchange. We we really are late, John. Well, just very briefly, just to re reiterate, that pseudonymizer idea that I showed you from Jem yeah. Rushbass is capturing all clinical data on our cancer patients. Yep. And yes. by pseudonymizing it, you can pool it from every health record. So in a single peer system, certainly, that's a viable a way yeah. of capturing some of that richness. Yep. It's fantastic. Sure. There, are, there are wonderful geeky methods uh, that you could yep. use with various uh, innovations in cryptography and so forth that we can make things better. 
It's yep. like going from the old hotel key to the, your, 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 you know, your plastic card. Uh, no, you can lose those. <laughs> All right. <laughs> right. David, thank you very much indeed, and that was a very good discussion. Um,